The events of 9-11, of course, catapulted us into a war, a real war, whose goals and geographic scope have steadily expanded. The attacks also introduced homeland security to our lexicon, adding a new concern that makes us more like the rest of the world than we have ever been before. Not safely set apart as Americans thought they were, protected by oceans and distance from others' conflicts, but irretrievably in their midst. September 11 taught us a new lesson. With global reach, there is no escape from terrorism. The attack on a nightclub in Bali, uh, the hostage taking in a theater in Moscow, and just as the World Trade Center, German citizens have been victims too. It's also becoming painfully clear in Europe that we are facing a common threat with international terrorism and that there is no distinction in the mind of the adversaries between the West in general, whether America or Europe. And here, a number of statements made by Al-Qaeda are more than clear. We may then be back in a situation not unlike the Cold War, where nonproliferation took a definite backseat to fighting that war. Now it may do the same to fighting terror. One of our new challenges is to undertake hard analysis about where priorities conflict and do not, and how can we avoid long-term damage to nonproliferation goals uh, by seeking short-term gains in counterterrorism goals. The sudden collapse of the Soviet Union created a vulnerable supply of nuclear, biological and chemical weapons and materials as well as know-how. The rise of global terrorism created a new demand for these weapons and also certainly an implicit willingness to use them. The threat includes but extends well beyond Russia and the former Soviet Union. Large amounts of civilian highly enriched uranium exist in dozens of civilian research facilities around the world. We're talking about the raw material of nuclear terrorism, stored in hundreds of facilities in dozens of nations. Based on IAEA calculations, only a relatively small amount of highly enriched uranium could be enough for a nuclear explosive device. And if the goal is to build a radiological dispersal device, or a dirty bomb, the amount can be even less. So there is no margin of error. We all need to apply the best technologies, the best knowledge, know-how, expertise, and experience that we can to this problem. In the past decade alone, the IAEA has reported about 200 attempts at the illicit smuggling of nuclear materials. Some reports are more credible than others, and most involve materials not always considered a threat. This phenomenon nonetheless tells us a number of things. First, there are any number of states and sub-state actors interested in acquiring nuclear or radiological materials. Second, even a little success in smuggling or theft can have a great impact. It remains next to impossible, it would seem to me, for a terrorist movement in the world of today to develop a nuclear weapon on its own. Of course, I'm not talking about a dirty bomb, but of a real a nuclear explosive device. But terrorists, on the other hand, could acquire one or more nuclear devices in cooperation with a state of concern. So I think if Al-Qaeda had stayed in Afghanistan, um, I think eventually it would have succeeded in making a nuclear weapon. Who knows how long it would have taken. Uh, they still would have needed to acquire fissile material, and who knows if that could have been accomplished. But I do think also that this program was nipped in the bud, um, and, and that uh, in that sense we were very fortunate. And needless to say, Al-Qaeda uh, can certainly build dirty bombs. And, and my own view is, is that if, if they wanted to build dirty bombs and they wanted radioactive material, they certainly have it already uh, or could fairly easily acquire it. I think we could all agree 
that securing fissile material is essential. That's the one uh, crucial barrier to nuclear terrorists actually building a improvised nuclear device. The know-how to build these devices is rather prevalent. What they're really lacking is enough fissile material. We paid so much attention to Russia because that is where so much of the material is. A January 2001 report noted that the fall of the Soviet Union led to the dissolution of an empire having over 40,000 nuclear weapons and over 1,000 metric tons of nuclear materials, and that the Russians lack the infrastructure to assure that chains of command remain intact and nuclear weapons and material remain secure beyond the reach of terrorists and weapons proliferating states. The consequences are so severe um, that it, it could, if they, particularly if a nuclear weapon uh, went off, it could fracture our, our, our societies and, and God knows how we would react. And so I think it has to be the, um, probably the highest U.S. priority to prevent such attacks from, from occurring. I'm often asked, how difficult is it to keep terrorists from attacking us with a nuclear weapon? My answer is that depends on how difficult we make it. Acquiring weapons and materials is the hardest step for terrorists to take and the easiest for us to stop. By contrast, every subsequent step in the process is easier for terrorists to take and much more difficult for us to stop. Once terrorists gain access to nuclear materials, they've completed their most difficult step, and our nightmare begins. We're still really lacking a good understanding about terrorist motivations to perform nuclear radiological terrorism, and we need to really do some more deep thinking about that. However, I, think, I would argue we have more control over securing nuclear and radiological materials, and we have less control over dissuading nuclear terrorists from actually conducting nuclear terrorism. We may not be able to make committed terrorists less evil, but we certainly can make them less powerful. We must keep them from acquiring weapons of mass destruction. Success is possible. Two years into my job as Secretary of Energy, I am convinced that despite the enormity of the challenge, success is possible. The risks associated with undersecured nuclear and radiological materials can and must be reduced.